Hey, AP Physics One Group. Um, Mr. Rosamund here. Glad to get back in on this. Um, starting our rotational motion unit. Um, and really, we're going to kind of regroup and talk about some of the rotational foundation stuff we talked about earlier, such as angular displacement, angular velocity, and angular acceleration. And then we're going to take it to the next step and kind of tie in more linear quantities, such as force and momentum and see what they look like to get things spinning in a circle. So um, this is from chapter seven and chapter eight, kind of taking a little bit from each one. And here we go. So just review, angular motion will be describing in terms of angular displacement, angular velocity, and angular acceleration. Uh, change in angle is awfully important here. Um, Remember, we want to measure it in radians, not actual degrees, so be careful with that. Angular velocity, which is the omega symbol there, would be radians per second, and then angular acceleration, which is the Greek letter alpha, would be radians per second squared. So very similar to our linear concepts of displacement, velocity, and acceleration. Just now, instead of meters per second, we're doing radians per second. So just angular displacement, um, we're always going to measure from a reference line. Essentially, an angle gives us a position. So if we're looking at it, um, here we'll have a reference line. And then that would be our initial position. And then you can see as it changes, this would be our final position. So it's really a delta theta will give us our displacement. Angular speed, right? The change in angle over the change in time. So looking at this, you would end up with radians per second. So essentially how fast is something spinning? Angular acceleration is the change in angular velocity over the change in time, very similar to our linear concept of acceleration. Looking at this, our units would be radians per second squared, and this tells us whether we're speeding up or slowing down while spinning. So the relationship between angular and linear quantities, essentially we're looking at the radius. The further out you get, it changes things. Um, so if we're looking at a record spinning on a record player, and I know that may not be all of you given the generation you live in, the inside and outside radiuses, radii, do not spin at the same linear velocity or linear acceleration. However, their angular equivalents are the same. So in other words, that whole thing has to spin in uniform velocity, uniform acceleration, but each individual point as it moves linear does not. So just kind of take a look at these three equations here. Notice this would be like arc length is angle and the radius, the tangential velocity as we often refer to it, or linear velocity, and then uh, tangential acceleration. So all of our kinematics equations that we used when we were doing linear motion still apply now that we're doing rotational motion. So with that, we just replace velocity with angular velocity, acceleration with angular acceleration, and instead of a displacement in, say, the x or the y, we have an angular displacement, a change in angle. So that's kind of a review. We've kind of dealt with some of these before um, to varying degrees of success. So now we're going to kind of recircle back to them, no pun intended on the circling, and move forward. So now we're looking at chapter eight, where we're going to start talking about how do we get things to actually move in a circle. Ultimately, when we did our force unit and talked about Newton's laws, we always assumed that we were treating everything as a point particle. So all of the forces acted on a very singular point located at the center of mass. In other words, when we were pushing on that crate to slide it across the floor, there was no way we were going to tip it over because we were always pushing at the center of mass. Well, welcome to the real world. We can actually tip that crate over if we want. We can rotate it. So looking at that, we're going to take a look at rotational dynamics. And then afterwards, we're going to look at angular momentum and see how that kind of plays a role. Pretty much everything we've talked about in class so far is going to be duplicated in this unit, just looking at things rotating rather than moving linear. So force versus torque. 
forces cause accelerations. If you don't know that by now, um, let's set up a time to talk. Um, just pure honesty there. Torques, which are related to forces, cause angular accelerations. So we can start to see the parallel between linear concepts, forces cause accelerations, and angular concepts, torques cause angular accelerations. So torque, the best way to explain it is kind of talking about how we open a door. So this is kind of the weirdest way you've ever seen a door. Think about it as a top-down view. So if you were like on the ceiling, like Spider-Man looking down, on the left-hand side, uh, labeled uh, O, we have where the hinges would be. And then you can kind of see the doorknob on the right-hand side. And then you see the force, which is being exerted at the doorknob, going up. So looking at this, when we're talking about torque, there's three things that we actually care about. How hard are we going to push the magnitude of the force? The position, where are you pushing on at the door? And the angle at which the force is applied. Are you pushing it straight on? Are you pushing it at some angle? So just kind of to show some different examples, which might give us different options. If I push here, sorry about my arrow, arrow assume that's a straight line, we'll get much different things happening with the door than if I pushed over where the blue arrow was. No different is if I stayed where the blue arrow was and pushed at some angle with the same force. We'll get different things happening. Weird thing is, and we've probably never noticed it, but there's been times where we've tried to push right on that hinge. You know, when you're walking to the gas station and you don't realize it's a pull and you accidentally try to push, or if you push instead of try to pull, Kind of the same idea here. If I push right on that hinge, we probably wouldn't expect that door to rotate. And then notice they've labeled it here for us, the R, which is really a position. So where is that force located? So for a couple other ones, this might be my R, or this would still be my R for the force and angle at the doorknob. And then the one right at the hinge, we would have an R of zero. So we're essentially measuring a distance from the axis. So torque. Torque is the Greek letter tau. Notice kind of goofy T here. Um, wiggle, squiggle. I almost think of it as a backwards J. And so here we're looking at torque is equal to the length of the position vector times the force. So not only do we care about how hard we're pushing, we want to know how far away from the axis are we pushing. Notice, the larger the R, so the further away from the axis of rotation that you're pushing, the larger your torque would be. So looking at this, it's very important to understand that if you want more torque, you have two options. Push or pull harder, larger force, or increase your distance away from the axis. So our unit, our Newton times meter. Hmm, let's see, force is measured in Newtons, and R is a length, so it's measured in meters. Newton meter just sounds way better than meter Newton. So just live with that there. Direction of torque. Torque is a vector quantity. No surprise there because force is a vector quantity. In other words, we care about the direction. So looking at this, we basically are going to go with a counterclockwise or clockwise idea here. And we've already talked about this when we did our rotational unit earlier. But we want to look at which way the force is kind of going. So if the turning tendency of the force is counterclockwise, in other words, if the force is trying to, doesn't necessarily mean it has to, but if the force is trying to rotate it counterclockwise, the torque is going to be positive. If the force is trying to make it go clockwise, the torque will be negative. So kind of thinking this through, if it wants to rotate this way, that's clockwise, it's going to be negative. If it wants to go counterclockwise, it's going to be positive. Kind of commit that to memory. 
right? Kind of commit that to memory. It's going to be huge because what's going to happen is we're going to have multiple torques on the same object. So some are going to be positive and some are going to be negative, and we're going to run into a problem is if we're not keeping them straight. So if it's trying to go counterclockwise, we're calling it positive. If it's going clockwise or trying to go clockwise, we're going to call it a negative torque. When two or more torques are acting, we're going to add them together. We just have to add them together as vectors, same as we did forces. So in other words, we care about the direction. Is it a positive or negative torque? Now, the good news is we don't really have to worry about torque and say the X and Y, because we just want to know, is it going to rotate counterclockwise or clockwise? where it's not moving in a linear fashion. Well, it could be, but torques aren't causing it to move in a linear fashion. Torques just cause rotation. Big idea here, if the net torque is zero, the object's rate of rotation doesn't change. Oh, if net force was zero, the object's rate of motion didn't change. In other words, if there was no force, we didn't accelerate. Hey, if there's no torque, we're not going to have an angular rotation, acceleration. So does that mean we still could be spinning? Yes, we're just not speeding up or slowing down. Torques cause it to speed up or slow down when it's rotating. So general definition of torque, right? We have to understand that the applied force um, may not actually be doing much to cause rotation. It depends on the angle. So if the force is not perpendicular, we have to look at the component that is perpendicular. And this comes back to our idea of when we're talking about work, work equals force times a distance, which we said, okay, yeah, that's true, but it's better if we said F cosine times the distance. In other words, just the component of the force that's doing the work. This is the same idea. We want to look at just the component of the force that is generating the torque. So if we go back to our door example, let's go back to the door example. For our blue arrow here, we saw that all of that force is trying to rotate it. Notice it's perpendicular. The one that's at an angle out here at the doorknob, this red arrow, not all of it is going to trying to get this thing to rotate. Some of it, in this case, it would be like in the X direction, would be trying to rip it off the hinges. Mm, don't really care about that force. It's not causing rotation. Therefore, it doesn't do anything with the torque. So if I were trying to find out how much torque this angled force had, I would be looking at just the Y component. So normally I'd just throw in some Sokotoa and figure out what that Y component is. Still use the same R value though. So let's just get to here. Here's, oh, could just went right to this, forgot to put this in here. So looking here, notice there is no component that is trying to rotate that door. Literally, this is just someone trying to pull off the hinges. Not going to rotate at all. Here, only F sine theta is going to be causing the rotation. The rest of it is just going to try to rip it off the hinges. So taking the angle into account gives us a new equation, and this is the one we should commit to. This is the one that we should say, hey, look, this is important. Torque equals the distance away from the axis times the component of the force causing the rotation. So theta, the easiest way to measure it, is the angle between the force and the position vector. So it might be important to draw some diagrams here to make sure we understand what's going on. So here, talking about a lever arm, that's essentially what's causing the torque here. So notice back to our door example, this is where I drew my red arrow, they got a nice blue arrow in there for me. And what we want to look for is R, and then the component of the force. So here, right, the lever arm is going to be R sine theta. Notice in our torque equation, it'd be the lever arm times the force if R sine theta is D. 
So looking at this, this is just kind of a cheat. I always like to just look at the component of the force. It makes life a little bit easier for me. Torque and axis, right? You as the physicist, as the scientist, as the poor student that's trying to work their way through this, you get to determine where the axis of rotation is. For our door example, it made sense to put it where the hinge was. That's where we actually know it's going to rotate about. But it doesn't have to be that axis. I could have actually chosen any axis of rotation I chose. And it doesn't even have to be a physical axis. For example, you can be rotating around a point in space where there is nothing. High jumpers are a really good example of this, and this is something you might want to YouTube or do some searching for. But ultimately, when a high jumper jumps over a, a bar that's six foot in the air, their center of mass doesn't actually go over the bar, it goes under the bar. And it's partially because they're rotating around an axis that's lower than the bar. Um, just kind of interesting side note there. But what this ultimately does is gives us the option to choose whatever axis we want. And once we choose it, for that set problem, that is what it is. If I want to change it, I essentially have to start the problem all over again. So looking at that, choosing your axis of rotation is very important, but yet if you choose, say, the wrong, I'm doing air quotes here, the wrong axis of rotation, you're still going to be okay. You just might be a little sloppier with how you get to your answer. Um, ultimately, we want to choose an axis of rotation that's going to make one of our torques go to zero. And when I walk through some problems with you, you'll understand what I mean by that. So the right-hand rule. A um, couple right-hand rules in physics. This would be the first one you are involved with. So essentially take your hand. Hey, hold on. Freeze. Take your right hand. Very important there. Being a left-hander, um, didn't dawn on me for a while, but you actually have to use your right hand for this or it doesn't work. So take your right hand, point the fingers in the direction of the position vector. So in other words, take your right hand and align your pinky and the edge of your hand along the R vector. And then you're going to curl your fingers towards the force vector. Okay, so if it's anything like what I'm doing right now, I have my hand at some angle, it point in the R direction, and then I'm curling my fingers towards the left, towards the force vector. So my thumb is pointing me in the face right now. That's the direction of your torque. Mm, okay, well, we talked about direction of torque already, and we said, hey, we're going to describe it as counterclockwise or clockwise. Weird thing is, is cock clockwise and counterclockwise isn't always a great way to do things because you're assuming we're all standing on the same side of the clock. If you're actually able to stand on the other side of the clock, we might argue about which way things are going. So in this case, we have a direction of the torque that would be like out of the page or out of the screen as you look at it. And if that force vector was going in the other direction, we would have it going into the page. Just kind of confusing on that. But ultimately think, as you're doing the right hand rule, if you end up pointing your thumb towards you, it's gonna be positive. If your thumb ends up pointing away from you, it's going to be negative. So net torque. Hmm. If you liked net forces and understood net forces, net torque is gonna be easy. If you didn't understand net forces and net forces were hard for you, net torque might help you understand what's going on with net forces a little bit. So we kind of have a win-win situation here. Essentially, net torque is add up all the torques. Just like net force was add up all the forces. Now, the good news about torques is we don't have to worry about X and Y and all this. So when we're dealing with forces, we could have X positive, X negative. We could have Y positive, Y negative. And you could have components that would figure into that. With torques, once we calculate each individual torque, it's either going to be positive or negative. 
makes life really kind of easy. Remember, counterclockwise torques are positive, clockwise torques are negative. So, equilibrium. So far, when I've used the term equilibrium, I meant that there was no net force. While that's true, it wasn't 100% honest and complete. Let's put it that way. Um, it's kind of like telling your, your parents that you were at, you know, Jimmy's house. And you were, but you kind of just neglected to tell them that you also stopped at Sally's house and you also went to the park and blah, blah, blah. Uh, now, here's the whole truth. Not holding anything back. There are two conditions for equilibrium. The first one is, I already gave you, net force has to equal zero. In other words, that means we're not going to have an acceleration. That's the first condition of equilibrium. The second condition of equilibrium, which I've left out, is your net torque has to equal zero. You can't have an angular acceleration. Equilibrium, think, no accelerations, linear or angular. It doesn't matter. We can't increase our speed in any way, shape, or form. And we also can't increase how fast we're spinning or decrease how fast we're spinning. Two conditions for equilibrium. If you're an AP test taker, kind of a big, huge thing here. If you see that there's rotation in the problem, you probably instantly want to write down the first two conditions for equilibrium. And really, all you need to do to make life nice and easy for everyone involved is write these three things down. Net force in the X is zero, net force in the Y is zero, and my net torque is zero. Those three things are key. Notice, I didn't say that my net force was zero. That's kind of like sophomore level type stuff. We want to make sure we're able to split into the X and Y component. So, two conditions for equilibrium. So now when we talk and say something is in equilibrium, we now know that there's two things that have to hold true. No acceleration, no angular acceleration. No net forces, no torques. So, when we select an axis to do a problem, we want to do it to make life as easy as possible for us. So when I do it, I will always choose an axis that makes one of my torques equal to zero. In other words, once I've drawn my diagrams, I will put and label my axis of rotation right where one of the forces are pushing. That way that torque is zero. All it does is make life easier. Now, there's going to be times where you don't get to choose where the axis of rotation is. For example, the door problem, I just told you, and if you're reading the book like you should be, the book will just tell you it's where the hinges are. You just got to make do with what you get. So let's take a look at this equilibrium example. Equilibrium. So, if you're following along, there's two conditions for equilibrium. One, I'm not going to really care about too much with this. Essentially, the first one tells me, that there's no linear acceleration. There's no net force. In other words, these two people and the seesaw are not flying off to the left, not flying off to the right, not accelerating up, not accelerating down. There's zero linear acceleration. That kind of makes sense to us. The second condition for equilibrium is what's more crucial for us. In other words, they're not rotating. So this little girl is not going flying up into the air because dad sat down on the seesaw. So looking at this, they are perfectly balanced. Equilibrium, balanced, hopefully you can see the connection there. Now what we're going to look at is that it has to be our net torque that is zero. So this is going to be a little sloppy because I'm writing with a mouse. So net torque has to equal zero. So, just like how I would for a net force equation, I'm going to start here, and then I'm going to go ahead and say equals, and then I just add up all my torques. So right now, I have to choose an axis of rotation. So, really, there's three options here. Option one would be where the girl's sitting. Option two would be where the pivot point is, hint, hint. And then option three would kind of be where the man is sitting. Now, there's an infinite number of rotation axes that I could choose. 
I could choose the end of the board. I could choose way up here in outer space. It doesn't matter. I would just then have to measure all those different R's, the distance away from the axis of rotation. Now, that being said, they've given me the position of the girl, the position of the fulcrum, and kind of told us that X is the position of the man. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and say, and I'm going to put an X right through it, that right where that fulcrum is, is my axis of rotation. So looking at this, <clears throat> I have eliminated two forces. If I'm looking at this, this MP1G, which was the mass of the wooden board, right? Doesn't matter anymore. It's not causing rotation. The normal force is also not causing rotation. That's good. So there's only really two torques I have to worry about. The force from the man and the force from the girl are both causing torques. So we can think about it this way. Torque from the girl plus torque from the man. Notice, I haven't gotten into whether one's negative or not. Sum means add them together. So that's what I'm doing right now. So looking at this, the good news is all of my forces are perpendicular to my distances, which means I don't have to worry about sine or cosine or any components of forces. So really, I have the force of the girl, mg, lowercase m, and the force of the man, uppercase mg. And then I can just go, hmm, okay, and then here are their distances, 2 meters and x meters. So the torque from the girl is going to be the force mg times the 2 meters. And then the torque for the man is going to be his force, uppercase mg, and I'm going to put times x because that's his distance. And remember, this is all going to be equal to 0. Now there's one thing that's really important. These torques are not trying to cause it, this to rotate in the same direction. The man's torque, this force, is trying to rotate it clockwise. Notice, if the girl jumped off, this whole thing would rotate clockwise. So what that means is that is negative. Remember, counterclockwise is positive. So really I'm going to have mg2 minus mgx equals zero. If I knew the masses, I'd easily be able to find out where dad should sit so that way this could be balanced and she's not going to be stuck in the air or stuck on the ground. So setting up net torque equations is just like setting up net force equations. So let's talk center of gravity. Center of gravity. We've kind of neglected this. And we've kind of talked about on the human body, it's right around where your belly button is, and that for a box, it'd be right in the center, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot more to it. Ultimately, the center of gravity is based on the position where the net torque of that particular object would be zero. So, in other words, if I were to put a balance an object on a pinpoint right around the center of gravity, it wouldn't rotate because all of the torques would quote unquote cancel each other out within that object. So you're probably going, well, what do you mean the torques inside the object? Well, think about each object being split into individual masses that are at different distances away from the center. Almost atom by atom type idea and each atom's pulling, being pulled down by gravity. So how those atoms are distributed really matter. So we're going to look at kind of the center of gravity as being where the force of gravity is acting on it. So if we're looking at this man here on the right-hand side of the screen, right, we can say, okay, well, his legs are pulling down on this side of him, and you know his butt's pulling down on the right-hand side, and his hands seem to be out in front. And so his center of mass would have to be right, you know, here. Yeah, that's perfect. And what we can then assume is that 
all of his mass is balanced right on that singular point. So we can say that force of gravity caused by that man is right there along the center of mass. So, calculate the center of gravity. This is what I'm talking about. If we had all of these individual particles, right, and so here we really just have one, two, three. Now, we could divide it into very large numbers, and calculus friends, you might really like these types of problems, or hate them. But ultimately, each one has an x and y component, and each one would be causing a torque. Each one would be causing this thing to try to rotate. Now, the center of gravity being right here means that all of the torques on this side balance with this side. All of the torques above balance with all the torques below. And we can even think about this in an XYZ type point where in and out of the page they'd all be balanced around the center of gravity as well. So looking at this, we're not going to get into too much on how to calculate it mathematically. I'll save that for all of your professors um, in college. But you can kind of take a look at it that um, for the center of gravity in the X, to find that location, it'd be the sum of all the masses times position divided by the sum of all the masses. Right? Y, find that position, it'd be the sum of all the masses times positions. Now that'd be for each individual part. So it'd be like M1, Y1 plus M2, Y2 plus M3 plus Y3 divided over the entire mass. Now, once you find your x, y, and z, that's essentially where your center of gravity is. We're going to talk about how to do it experimentally, which for anything you would need to do is going to be good enough. So, center of gravity and center of mass. You've probably noticed that I've been using them interchangeably throughout the year. And that's probably not great on my part, but the reality is they are the same thing, especially in my classroom. If the value of gravity, the acceleration of gravity, g, doesn't change throughout the object, then they're the exact same thing. The only way the center of gravity and the center of mass would be different is if that acceleration of gravity changed as you moved through the object. So it doesn't really work that great for, say, a ruler in my classroom or a ping pong ball in my classroom. But it may matter if we're looking at a more celestial scale. Let's look at uh, the solar system. Things might change there between the center of gravity and the center of mass. So when we're talking about a uniform object, right? Homogeneous means it's got the same density. It's made of the same stuff. It doesn't change throughout. And it's symmetric. Um, the center of gravity is going to lie on the axis of symmetry. So in other words, if you have a square, it's going to fall right in the middle of the length. It's going to fall right in the middle of the width, and it's going to fall right in the middle of the height. So, um, often the center of gravity is just the geometric center of the object. For a sphere, it would be right in the center of that sphere. Crazy idea there. For a rectangle, it would be in the center of rectangle. So imagine if you were to take the length and cut it in half, that's where the one axis would be. If you're able to cut the, the length and the height, it'd be the same thing. Um, so ultimately be thinking about that, that if you had a uniform rod um, of length L, the center of gravity would be located at L divided by 2. Um, and we'll see that in some problems where ultimately we need to know where to put that force vector for the weight of the object or the force of gravity of the object, so to say. So in other words, when we're looking at where should I put, you know, the force of gravity on my diagram, it needs to be where the center of gravity is. So we're going to have uniform objects. So essentially, if you have a board of, you know, that has a length of 40, well, then at the, the 20 meter mark is going to be where the center of gravity is, and that's where you should put your force of gravity. So, experimentally determining the center of gravity. To be honest, this is one of my favorite labs we normally would do in class. And ultimately what I'd do is I'd give you a bunch of random stuff. Starting off with just kind of two-dimensional objects, sheets of paper cut out in different shapes. And I'd ask you to find the center of gravity experimentally. 
So I would give you, say, a cutout of the state of Texas and go, go ahead and tell me where the center of gravity is. And you'd have to experimentally determine that. Now, to do that, all we really need to do is find two out of the three intersections of X, Y, Z center of gravity, and that'll give us where it's at. So if we think about it, we want to be able to just hang something, and that would tell us one of the lines, wherever it balances out at. So for the wrench here, we can kind of see that if we were to hang it from a string here from point C, and it would hang just like this. If you don't believe me, go out to the, the tool shed, hang something, and it'll hang just like this. This line that goes straight down would be one of the intersection lines to find the center of gravity. Notice if I were to tie the string over here at point A, and this is how it would balance out. In other words, the left hand side must have a little more mass than the right hand side. That's okay, because ultimately what we're looking at is how do the torques balance. So here, notice this dash line would be another intersection. So where those two intersect, at this point right down here, think line AB, line CD, where they intersect, would be where the center of gravity is. So we can do this with anything. Now, back to the state of Texas cutout on a piece of paper. What you could do is literally slide it over to, like, say, the edge of the table and find out where that balancing point is before it falls off the table. And right on the edge of the table would be one of the lines of intersection. You could spin it, you know, 30 degrees, do it again, and wherever those two intersect would be the center of gravity. So, I already mentioned this once, but it's worth mentioning again. Um, equilibrium drives me crazy. Oftentimes, students think that equilibrium means, oh, it's not moving. No, it just means that there's not an acceleration. It means we have uniform velocity. That may be a zero velocity. It may be a non-zero velocity. In other words, if there's no net force, we can still be moving. If there's no net torque, we can still be spinning. We can still be rotating. It just means we're not speeding up our rotation or slowing down our rotation. So be really careful about that. Equilibrium does not mean that it's not moving. So normally I cut this section out of the notes. The whole, hey, here's how to solve the problems. But I think this is really important for this because there's a lot going on in a given problem. So first thing you need to do anytime you're doing an equilibrium type problem is one, Diagram the system. And I'm not talking about necessarily free body diagram. Notice, that's step two. I'm talking about sketch it out. If we're talking about a bear walking out on a, walking the plank on a pirate ship, I want you to actually sketch that out. Now, my bear is going to be an awkward looking blob labeled bear, but it's going to be sketched out so I can see it. Then, I'm going to draw a free body diagram, showing all the forces acting on the object. So that's important. I have to choose an object that makes sense to the problem. Which object do I think is going to move linear and or rotate? That's the object in question. So I may not care about what's happening with the bear. I may care about what's happening with the plank. In that case, diagram everything for the plank. Now, here for step one, it says choose a convenient notation axis. I do that after I've done the free body diagram. Because if I can get rid of a force and have it not be a torque, or I can get rid of two forces and not have it be a torque, I'm going to do that. So remember, always choose a rotation axis that's going to be where one of your forces is pushing on the object. And then we're going to apply the two conditions of equilibrium. I'm going to set up a series of equations. I'm going to go ahead and say, look, my net torque is this and we're going to kind of talk about what that can be right now so far we've said zero that's if it's in equilibrium so right now for in equilibrium i'm going to say net torque equals zero net force in the x equals zero net force in the y equals zero if you're keeping track that's three equations hopefully there's only one unknown that we need to find that gives us options but it says that we 
could solve up to three unknowns. Just have to do some fancy work with math. So, essentially, diagram it, draw the free body diagrams, choosing a rotation axis that makes sense, and then write out our net torque and net force equations. You should have three. Net force in the X, net force in the Y, and net torque. Solve for the unknown. So, here's a great example, right? Notice, this would be the sketch of what's going on, right? So, it looks like someone's holding a bowling ball. Yeah, great, okay? So, what object do I care about? Hmm, in this case, it looks like the ulna is going to be what's rotating. Okay, ulna, great. No one cares, that's squishy science. Hey, this thing here, great. I'm going to represent it with just this for my free body diagram. Now, I'm going to indicate every force that's acting on it. So right now, I can see where my point of rotation is there, still here. Right. Now, 50 newtons, that was the weight of the bowling ball. Right. This force here looks like it was probably the force of the bicep. And then this R thing, hmm, not really sure what's going on there, but the good news is, don't care because that's the origin, it's not going to cause a torque. So there's really the force of the bicep pulling up and the weight of the bowling ball pulling down that's going to rotate that object, which in this case is the ulna. So looking at this, the distances matter, how far out that bicep is attached and how far out the bowling ball is. Crazy simple thing that you can do at home right now. Take any object you want, right? The heavier, the better. Um, you know, earlier today I was kind of doing it with my two-year-old. But if you hold them close to you, it's really easy to hold them. I can hold my 30-pound my two-year-old for like an hour if I'm holding him against my chest and he's nice and close. As soon as I extend him out from my body, say, you know, fully extended with my arms out, well, now he's two and a half feet away. The torque that he's able to generate is huge. So notice here, if this bowling ball were closer, it wouldn't have nearly as much torque. Wouldn't have to pull as hard. So here's another uh, free body diagram. Here's a ladder leaning against a wall. Um, pretty classic physics problem here. Ultimately, we'd want to know forces and things to make it so it doesn't slip out. What angle should it be? Lots of questions we could ask here. But notice, so the ladder is going to be the thing that would be rotating. And so here, they chose the axis of rotation to be the bottom of the ladder. Could have been the top of the ladder. Could have been the middle of the ladder. Don't care. One of the reasons they chose the bottom is because then that eliminates the normal force here from the ground pushing up. Does not cause rotation. And then that frictional force also does not cause rotation. Do they still hold it in place? Absolutely. They're part of the net force. They're just not going to be part of the net torque. So ultimately, there's two things here. The wall pushing out and the weight of that ladder are the two things that can cause rotation. So notice, if the weight of the ladder is too much, we'll see a rotation in the negative direction because that'd be clockwise. And if the wall's pushing too hard, which would be really an odd thing, we would see that this would rotate counterclockwise or in a positive direction. So looking at this, we just have to be careful because not all of this weight from the ladder is going to cause rotation. We would have to use just a component here that is would be perpendicular to the distance. So here's another one of a beam. And ultimately, we have a bunch of forces um, pushing and pulling on a beam. This could be the beam itself, probably because it's right in the center of gravity. So this is probably the weight of the beam. This might be someone standing on it. This might be a cable, and this might be a cable. Who knows? So looking, what we can do here is go, hey, look, force, 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 force. And then I have to choose where my origin is going to be for my axis of rotation. So I would put it at either end, right? Why would I choose at either end? Well, if I'm looking at this, if I put it here, 
it gets rid of that goofy force at an angle. Or if I put it here, it gets rid of the tension force at some goofy angle. In other words, I don't have to worry about the components going on there. I can just say, hey, look, that doesn't matter because it's at the axis of rotation. So then I'm playing with one, two, three forces causing torques instead of, say, four. So, torque and angular acceleration. Whew. So far we've looked at torque in the sense of equilibrium, saying, hey, look, we don't want there to be an angular acceleration. But what if we do want there to be an angular acceleration? What if we do want something to spin? Well, then we have to have a torque, right? No net torque said no angular acceleration. Well, if you want angular acceleration, you need net torque. So ultimately, the relationship that we had, Newton's second law, of net force equals mass times acceleration can be reapplied with our rotational motion. Net torque equals hmm something similar to mass times acceleration but probably not mass times acceleration. Well I know it's going to be angular acceleration so let's just take a look and see if mass is still the same. No it's not and here's why. When we're dealing with the whole object moving left to right, up or down, we said all of that mass was concentrated at a given point. That's fine. When we're talking about an object rotating, how that mass is distributed really matters. If that mass is spread way out really far, <coughs> excuse me, it might be really hard to get it to accelerate, angularly speaking. So what we look at is something we call moment of inertia. Moment of inertia takes into account that the mass is distributed some distance away from the center of mass. So what we see in our equation is capital I is the moment of inertia. It's the sum of each individual mass, so we can think particle by particle, times its distance away squared. And the units are goofy, kilograms times meters squared. And we're going to see how this plays a role here. So what we have, Newton's second law for rotating objects, is net torque equals moment of inertia, that's that capital I, times angular acceleration. Angular acceleration, alpha. So here, this is Newton's second law. F equals ma. Torque equals I alpha and I's moment of inertia. So looking at that, same relationship, just rotational instead of linear. So moment of inertia. It depends on how much matter you have and how it's distributed. It also depends on the location of the axis of rotation. The good news for us is anytime we need a moment of inertia, it's either going to be given to us or it's going to be easily calculated and the equation will be given to us. For the sake of class right now, you'll find a table in your book that will have all the moment of inertia equations. So, moment of inertia of a uniform ring. So notice, we're going to be looking at different shapes because that's how the mass is distributed. My calc friends can kind of see how we could do a lot of calc here is if we were able to take this ring and split it into, I don't know, let's say an infinite number of small masses. So here, right, um, each segment, M1, M2, M3, is all the same distance, capital R, away from the, the axis of rotation. So what we get here is we can just go the sum of MR squared, which is our equation for moment of inertia, we can say, hey, for a uniform ring, it's the total mass times r squared. And that r is uniform throughout. So we kind of get to cheat and just say, look, this is what it is for a uniform ring. Here's other moments of inertia. And this is the table I was talking about that's in your book. So normally if we had all sorts of time in the world, which we never do, I would walk you through how each one of these is kind of derived. Uh, 
where we can see the moments of inertia are really just the sum of each mass times r squared. So what we saw here was for a ring, it was mr squared. Well, guess what? That ring, if it's thick like a hoop or a cylindrical shell, right? it's still going to be the same. It doesn't matter if it has some height to it or not. So you can think about the hoop is often what it's called, is also a uniform ring. If it's a solid cylinder, right, and you're going to see this one probably quite a bit, that in the solid sphere, is the moment of inertia is one half mr squared. In other words, notice the moment of inertia got smaller, one half mr squared, if these were the same mass, because more of the mass is around the center or near the axis of rotation. In other words, because the mass is closer to the axis of rotation, it has a smaller moment of inertia. More of the mass is spread out at a distance, the larger the moment of inertia. Solid sphere, 2 fifths mr squared. And then thin spherical shell, 2 thirds mr squared. So notice when we go from a solid sphere and we take, say, that same m mass, and spread it all out to be all further away, none's near the axis of rotation, we get a larger moment of inertia. And then this last bottom row here is a good example of how the axis of rotation matters. If we have a long thin rod and we choose the axis of rotation to be through the center, then its moment of inertia is 1 12th ml squared. Whereas if we chose the axis of rotation to be through the end of that long thin rod, we'd be talking one third ml squared. So moments of inertia, all we really need to know is that when we rotate an object, we don't just care about the mass, we care about how the mass is distributed. So the shape of the object matters. And then we use the corresponding equation for I. So. Newton's second law for rotation. If I want something to have an angular acceleration, I need a torque. So here, if this bucket is falling, right, here we would see net force equals mass times acceleration. We would see that the, uh, if it were falling, that the force of gravity would be going faster if it were accelerating downward. Right? Now, we can see that this wheel on the well would also spin. So, axis of rotation in the center, I don't care about the mass of the wheel, I don't care about the normal force pushing up on the wheel, all I would care about is that torque. Now, what's important to understand here is that the torque causing, or the tension causing the torque, is also the same tension that's causing that to move. Those are the same tensions. So, the tension pulling up and the tension pulling down are the same tensions. So ultimately what I could do is set up a net force equation for the bucket. Uh, net force equation for the wheel would just be zero because all of these forces have to cancel out because the wheel's not accelerating up, down, left, or right. Then notice the bucket isn't rotating, so I wouldn't have any net torque equations, but I would have a net torque equation for the wheel. So here I would have a net torque equation, and over here I would have a net force equation. Two equations I can solve for some unknowns. Alright, we're 54 minutes in or so. If you haven't gotten up and stretched, shame on you. Uh, this is a video. You can pause at any point. Um, please do. If you are listening to me for, I don't know, more than 10 minutes without hitting the pause button, um, you might have problems. Yeah. So, I'm going to take a drink. Made some tea today. It's kind of nice. All right. So, you know how I kind of lied to you about the equilibrium stuff earlier? Yeah. I also lied about energy, where we said, hey, mechanical energy, that's gravitational potential energy. That's spring potential energy, and that's kinetic energy. Well, I might have forgot to tell you guys that there's another type of kinetic energy. Rotational kinetic energy. 
And rotational kinetic energy just says, hey, look, if you take any object, it takes work to get it to rotate. Work equals the change in energy, so, hey, look, kinetic energy. Hmm. Kinetic energy was based on the movement of an object. For linear kinetic energy, it was one-half mv squared. Rotational kinetic energy, we still have the one-half, but when we're rotating, we don't just care about the mass, we care about the moment of inertia, how that mass is distributed. So we're looking at one-half moment of inertia, I, times not velocity, but angular velocity, squared. So we have omega squared. So really sciencey, right? Rotational kinetic energy equals one half the moment of inertia times the angular velocity squared. Yeah, I sound smart, but what does it all mean? In other words, the faster it's rotating, the more rotational kinetic energy it has. And that's actually um, kind of a big deal to make note of, that it's actually an exponential, sorry about that, an exponential relationship there. So if you double the angular velocity, you're actually quadrupling the amount of rotational kinetic energy it has. Moment of inertia, now remember that's going to be replaced by some version of mr squared, whether that's two-thirds mr squared, depends on the shape. Um, but notice that's kind of the angular component of mass that we're looking at. So energy concepts can make life easy sometimes. I know if we were talking about how fast an object can hit the ground, rather than doing any kinematics work and going, well, acceleration and then final velocity and blah, blah, I would just go, hey, look, potential energy became kinetic energy. And the same is true for rotational kinetic energy. It can make it really easy if I'm trying to figure out how fast it'll be spinning at the end or how fast it'll be spinning at the beginning. But what that means is that everything we've done with energy especially conservation of energy, we kind of neglected the rotational kinetic energy. So I'll have another video about that later where you'll see, hey, now that we have this, how does that change some of our problems? This is essentially it, right? Now here, I really don't like this equation either because you have gravitational potential energy, but you don't have spring potential energy. And you also don't have any work involved here. So in my other video, I'll kind of go more in depth on this whole conservation of energy with rotational kinetic energy. Notice they have T here, right, uh, for translational, or you can think about it just as linear kinetic energy. So work energy in a rotating system, I'll talk about that later. But ultimately, here is work can equal the change in rotational kinetic energy. Just like work could equal the change in potential energy, work could equal the change in uh, linear kinetic energy, work is just the change in energy. I don't care what kind of energy. So problem solving hints. Um, really just before and after type ideas. Um, and then we're getting close to the end here. So bear with me. Um, use that pause button frequently. Angular momentum. Linear momentum, we were analyzing what happened when two objects interacted with each other and we ultimately were calling them collisions and saying hey look if object a hits object b what's going to happen i want to do the same thing if there is and i'll go back to the record player spinning right what happens when the dj puts his puts his hand on the wheel and starts squeaking the wheel back and forth right well things change right we have uh angular accelerations that could happen we could have all sorts of different things. Angular momentum is something that's really important that we understand because it obeys everything that linear momentum had. So how did we get a linear momentum? Well, we need an impulse. We needed a force for some duration of time. Well, we're going to say the same thing. How do you get an angular momentum? Well, we're going to need a torque for some amount of time. And angular momentum is denoted by capital L and is the moment of inertia times the angular velocity. Whoa, that's crazy. You're telling me that momentum is something to do with its mass times its velocity? Hmm, yeah, momentum was mass times velocity. Here, angular momentum is moment of inertia, which is our mass equivalent when we're doing rotation, 
to our angular velocity. And what we'll see here is, and at the bottom here, net torque equals the change in angular momentum over the change in time. Well, earlier we had F delta T equals the change in momentum. Impulse equals the change in momentum. Here, this is no different. If we multiply both sides by delta T, we get uh, torque times delta T equals change in angular momentum. If you have a torque, a net torque, you'll change the angular momentum. Make sense? If we had a net force, we changed the momentum of the object. So if the net torque is zero, the angular momentum remains constant. Now this is important, conservation of angular momentum. Same thing as conservation of momentum, right? That the initial angular momentum will equal the final angular momentum. Now, what we saw in the linear was masses of objects didn't really change unless they combined in a inelastic collision and became one mass. We can still see that with angular momentum. But what we'll also see is that things can change shape and size with angular momentum. So what that means is our moment of inertia can also change. So moment of inertia can change or the angular velocity can change or some combination, but ultimately the angular momentum of a system, if there's no net torque, is conserved. So net torque equals zero, angular momentum is conserved. What you start with is what you have to end with. So here's how it kind of looks mathematically. If your net torque is zero, then your initial momentum equals to your final momentum. Or we can think of it as moment of inertia times angular velocity equals the final moment of inertia times the final angular velocity. Special note here, normally we're used to dealing with the velocities changing. I've already said it once, I'm saying it again. Be aware that the moment of inertia can change for an object. Example, I think everyone's seen it in my room and I'm sad that we didn't get to actually do this. You know that circular disc that weighs like a ton that's usually in the corner of my room that I'm pretty sure Trey has spun on and I bet most of you have spun on it at some point, whether I was in the room or not. Um, yeah, everyone always asks, what is that for? And I only really have one answer. It's my conservation of angular momentum. And that's it. That's what I use it for. That's the only purpose I have. Right? Why do I spin in a chair all the time? Well, conservation of angular momentum. Ultimately, I would have loved to show you this demonstration. And if I can sneak up to the school and get it and bring it home, I might actually still do it. But don't tell anyone. We'll see. But looking at this, conservation of angular momentum. Here's a figure skater. Right? You've probably seen it. If not, YouTube it. But when they start to spin, they fly. Their angular velocity is tremendous. How do they do that? Notice this picture here tucked up nice and tight. This figure skater made their moment of inertia very, very small. So if you have a small moment of inertia and angular momentum needs to be conserved, your angular velocity has to increase. So if she were trying to spin with her arms straight out, she can't go that fast because she has a large moment of inertia. Start tucking those arms in tighter and tighter and tighter and notice they're even crossed on her chest, then she has a larger angular velocity. Now, as soon as she wants to start slowing down, looking at this, right? As soon as you extend your arms, you increase your moment of inertia, thus decreasing your angular velocity. So, you can just go back and forth. And if I had my platform, you could do that. Right? What's even better is if you had, say, two pound uh, masses in each hand, that makes it even more extreme. Right? So think about that. 
as your example for angular momentum as you start approaching problems. So one hour, five minutes, I'm done. I'll have more specific sections of notes and working through problems, um, especially with that rotational kinetic energy stuff and, and torque and angular acceleration. We'll do some practice problems with that. But this is the unit in a nutshell. So um, feel free to let me know if you have any questions on this, but I will be talking to you guys soon. Take it easy.